Cool. We have Barbara here. Hello. I, I know Barbara so last year, yeah. the year before. Mm. Which last year and the year before. Yeah, we first met like three years ago. Uh -huh. Through Donald, yeah. Okay. The mutual friend. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, last year we did uh, quite some shows together. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> you performed both really good for the mental health show and also for the um, uh, Black Widows. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was really fun. I loved both of those shows. It was really fun. It was really fun because I got to do my my mental health material in one of them and then my kind of dark stuff in the other one and yeah, yeah. this year they're in the same show so <laughs> while well, they're in my show yeah but uh, at least you uh for next week you can do the uh, depression versus anxiety yeah because i wasn't able to do any of that yeah with donald's show was, yeah because i was <coughs> i was a fairy in a children's show for about, uh, about two weeks Yep. At least you are a parent, so. Yeah. 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 And uh, so this year we we stayed with Donna, so we are all in a flat. We are flatmates now. Yep. <laughs> and uh, I really enjoy sometimes in the evening just to uh, see you and Donna in the kitchen. Yeah. And we chat. Yeah, bit. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, for me, like, you know, Donald and I met in London and then we became good friends. And then, like, the only time I really get to see him is here at the fringe because otherwise sometimes he comes to london for a couple of days but because he tours you know he tours a lot of different places so yeah it's fun mm -hmm. yeah and uh so what do you do this year at the fringe so this year i have my solo show for the first time singing sagging and shagging uh and i'm really happy with it because it's like all of the material from my club sets and i put it into one like big storyline um, so the first part of the show is I tell all these like crazy but true stories about like a dating disaster in a ditch and another like an ex that did some stupid things with a pillow. Anyway, um, and then there's a lot of like crazy stories where I give enough detail so that people know that they're true. And then like three quarters of the way through the show, I'm like, ha ha ha, guess why all this stuff happened to me? It's because I have borderline personality disorder. Oh! Oh yeah, and then I yeah, and then I I do a couple jokes about that, and then I do like a like a like a serious bit about it where because um, by that time like people have been laughing with me for about thirty thirty five minutes, so then I just ask permission. I say, you know, is it is it okay if I share something a bit heartfelt with you for a minute? Fortunately, so far, touch wood, they've said yes. Um, it's in the show. Uh, so then I share with them what it's really like uh, having BPD. Uh, and then I sing like a little bit of a tear jerking song about that. And then I come out of it with like a finale celebration song. I, you I... are spoiling your show. <laughs> no, you want to come and see. Um, yeah, if you like uh, parodies from the 80s and 90s, then yeah, people would like it. Um, but what I'm enjoying is that people that don't know anything about, because I didn't, I didn't, uh, I called it singing, sagging, and shagging. I didn't call it, you know, the BPD show or something on purpose because the the main bulk of the show is all crazy stories. You know, the mental health thing comes into it towards the end. But um, but I wanted something where like people could have a good time and then they would learn something about or experience something about about BPD. But but as an aside, kind of, you know, not the main message. So my show next year is going to have going to delve more into BPD. So next year I'll do two shows. So I already planned it. <laughs> yeah, well, the idea w worry for your was no, 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 it'll be alright. Well, next year I'm going to pay for a flyer. Mm -hmm. That's what I will do. Yeah. And next year I'm going to do a work license before this. Oh, I can't do, do yeah, 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 yeah. Well, because it's difficult. Because like, well, like when I sing, I can sing for hours, and my voice will get better and better. But when I talk, it's not the same because I haven't been like I've been trained to sing correctly, but when we talk it's like I'm just used to just talking you know I don't mm -hmm. think about how my voice is placed when I talk so especially like if you sing and then you go and and you talk outside your vocal cords have already been opened up quite a bit so I just have to be very careful after my show mm -hmm. so like after my show I usually just go home <laughs> or I don't I don't say very much um That's yeah good advice yeah 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 you don't the last thing you want to do is if you're singing a lot if you immediately then uh, go into an environment where it's cold and start talking. That's so. Not is the good. cold water also bad? No, but like talking in the cold, 
I find for me is not good at all. Um, because the cold air just, mm -hmm. just you know, I think cold water, like yeah, I think I ice so cold water right after singing probably isn't great. But mm -hmm. I've never, mm -hmm. I've never, I've never done that. Another um, so, how old are you now? Sure. So I am at this at this moment in time. I am drum roll. I am sixty two. <gasps> Wow, you are even older than my mom. Do you know? <laughs> but you are so wise. Yeah. yeah, well, I got my life back at, you know, 60, so, well, yeah. Um, well, yeah, part of that's the BPD. Apparently, a lot of us are very, like, childlike and energetic, and um, we think very quickly a lot of the times because of, like, trauma and stuff, so our brains are used to just, just I don't know, moving really fast. Um, but also, like, I got diagnosed at age 58, and so it was only then that I, because with BPD, there's a big problem of identity and knowing who you are, so I'd always wanted to do comedy ever since I was in my 20s, but I thought I couldn't do it because I can't remember other people's jokes. I, but I can remember mine, but my brain was just like, oh no, you can't do it, you can't remember jokes. So anyway, long story short, like once I got diagnosed, a lot of it is you learn to regulate your emotions and then you, you learn who you are because like, um, with BPD, we try to please everybody, but it's unconscious. So we try to become the person we think they want us to become. And because it's unconscious, without realizing it, like we're hiding who we are from ourselves. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like a chameleon. Right? And the uh, question, since you are 62 years old. Yeah. You were... Uh, I don't feel like it. <laughs> no. Well, you are uh, slut. <laughs> oh, totally. How wild were you? Oh, my early twenties. Did 20s. you do drugs? No, I didn't do. I didn't do drugs. So there's different kinds of like because most of the time, if you have BPD, you can be quite reckless because the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, that's the part that um, rational. Yeah, rational mind, right? So with BPD, it's smaller than normal. So it's almost as if you have a teenage brain and you still do reckless things. So for some people, that recklessness might manifest as drug use. Some it might be alcohol. Mine, it was yeah, just going home with random guys. So I have a long, 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 long list of, you know, exes and one night experiences and, uh, and stuff like that. And I was a singer at the time, so it was quite easy because... Were you like the, the hottest girl <laughs> all around you? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. I'm, well, yeah, that, that, that sounds weird because if I say yes, it sounds like I'm bigging myself up. But apparently, yes, according to... Uh, according to some people, when they see my picture, they're like, oh, okay, I see why the guys went for you. And, and also, I was singing on a bar in a short dress, in a mini dress, oh. like on top of a bar, on top of tables. Wow. Singing rock songs, you know, so, yeah. Wow, you're a good <laughs> bitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Another question, I always wonder this, that, uh, uh, you know, beautiful women have their power. Yeah, I used it. And yeah. uh, and uh, was it like depression, depressing that uh, one day you realized that power just gone? Was it hard to or sad? Oh, no, because like what happened was like, I just got tired. Like when I met my second husband, um, I I just got tired of all the like running around and the one night stands and all the like ups and downs and ups and downs. It's like an emotional, you know, roller coaster all the time. And I thought, oh, I just want somebody stable. No, I don't mean only relationship wise. I mean, like when you go out, like yeah. uh, you can get what you want by a little bit of floating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here yeah. and there. But uh, from my observation, I hear some women, they, they were once so hot, but the aging kick in. Yeah. But they just don't realize they don't have it anymore. Yeah, so, you do become more invisible. So, I mean, mm -hmm. but the reason I mentioned that the, yeah, the marriage to the guy wanting stability is because... You know, once once I got married and had kids and stuff, ugh, yeah, everything changed. So I wasn't flirting with anybody. I was too busy feeding babies. So, um, and then you know, I totally focused on my kids. So it was it more it was more like um, all of a sudden, yeah, it, it was kind of all of a sudden. I guess I kind of didn't notice. I was too busy with too busy with my kids. But then it was actually when I started doing comedy. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I thought, oh yeah, it's a bit different when you're. Middle-aged woman. I, I think it was more like, uh, well, when I was middle-aged and then, you know. Because um, when I was in my 20s, I was always harassed everywhere I went. I was living in Paris, and it was like on the street, 
on the tube, on You're the bus. You're really a cool oh. bitch. <laughs> I guess so. But it was annoying that I couldn't walk anywhere without some guy, like, you know, shouting out at me or trying to get with me or something. It was, it was, that, that was really annoying because I didn't, well, yeah, and I had to put on quite a tough exterior. I'm, I'm from New York, so that was easy to do, to put on a tough exterior. Yeah, I will, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I would have, like, a tough face, you know, because if you show weakness they sense it and then they just, you know, so if I was ever feeling, I always noticed if I was feeling depressed in my early twenties, oh, that was a bad idea to get on public transport because they just notice and they just come for you. Whereas if I was, you know, feeling okay and strong and confident, I mean, well, I did get held up, <laughs> held up at gunpoint once when I was feeling strong and confident, but that was okay because I faked my way out of it. But, um, that's another story, but, uh, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it is kind of a, it's kind of a relief, though, to not have to be, like, harassed anymore. That's very good. I, I feel like, oh, I can just be myself now and not have to. But the other weird thing is, like, most people, you know, most of the people around me in comedy, like, everybody's younger than me. So I'm actually amazed at how nice everybody is to me because, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of people I'm old enough to be their mom, but I don't think of myself as their mom. I think of myself as their peer, and that's what I love about comedy is that, yeah, comedy's not perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely not perfect. But at least in comedy, I don't have to look a certain way. I don't have to. I mean, yeah, okay, people say, yeah, it's harder. If, sure, if I started comedy in my early 20s, I'm sure that I would probably have, you know, won more gong shows and stuff because, uh, you know, the little, oh, yeah. Um, the young thing counts for a lot, I think, when you're, not to like, not to say anything negative about, I mean, you still have to be funny, right? But definitely helps, right? And for social media and stuff like that. Uh, and I don't have that, so I have to, you know, rely on being funny. Um, but yeah, I do, I do really appreciate how with comedy, like you don't have to be, you don't have to be a certain weight to be funny. You don't have to be a certain age to be funny. If you're funny, you're funny, you know? And yeah, there's going to be some, I guess there'll be some guys that'll be like, oh, women aren't funny, but I haven't touched wood. I haven't really experienced that. I mean, I'm based in London. Although I did tell you, I think that, uh, the other night in my show, <laughs> uh, this dude, he was laughing the whole time. And then like. I don't know. Oh, it was right when I did the serious bit of my show. I had just finished the tear-jerking song, and I'm about to tell a joke to break the tension. And he stands up from the back, and he's like, Oh, you're doing great, mate. I thought Americans weren't funny. And I was just like, oh, okay, thanks, dude. Yeah, kind of a long answer, but... And how, <clears throat> how did you realize you have the BPD? Um, so I got diagnosed, a family member got diagnosed, and then the family member told my ex-husband, they were like, I think Barbara has what I have. And then I had never heard of it before. So when I looked up the symptoms online, I was like, oh, because it's quite difficult to diagnose because it's like a mixture of like four or five different mental health conditions. So it's hard to kind of, it's kind of like trying to sort out threads that are all tangled up, right? They just thought I had, you know, depression. Um, and also like, the most successful treatment for BPD wasn't even and wasn't even a thing until the late seventies. Yeah, and I was born in the sixties, so yeah, it wasn't really around when I was growing up. And what's the main symptoms? Uh, difficulty regulating emotions. So, like the amygdala, the threat center in the brain, is bigger than normal, so we can get triggered by small things. So, for example, <laughs> if I'm on the tube, I control it now. I do manage it now. But if I'm on the tube in London, let's say someone I don't know. Someone pushes past me on the escalator. Like I might have this urge to just shove them down the stairs. I won't do it, obviously, but um, um, or I don't know if someone doesn't text me or something. My brain might be like, oh, they didn't text me. Nobody texts me. Nobody loves me. Oh, I might as well die. Oh, it's like a really quick spiral thing. But so, this sounds just like anxiety. It's kind of like you know how people with bipolar they have like mood swings, right? They can have like manic highs for days and then manic lows for days. Like it's kind of like that, but compressed. Because with BPD, you can have those manic highs and manic lows within the same minute or something. It can change really, really fast. Um, so you just you just like your emotions run away with you. So like uh, that's what you have to learn to control. So for example, if you get angry. It's just absolutely volcanic. I mean, it just feels like your whole body's almost like burning up and you have to do something about it. Um, same thing if you get sad, it's not just depression where you're so sad you can't move. It's more like, um, well, for me, it felt like there was something here that I just had to like 
try to get out. And that's why some people will self-harm. Some people will bang their head because it just feels like there's this knot right here in your third eye that you just, if you could just take it out, you would feel better. It's a bit graphic, but, um, so yeah, it's very, it's very, and also like relation, oh, relationships are a disaster, like all relationships, because it's kind of like, you don't really know fully who you are. It's hard to explain, but it's kind of like the way I explain it in the show is it's like, as if you're living in a fish bowl, so there's this glass wall between you and everybody. And it's almost like you're speaking a different language to everybody or like you're drowning underwater screaming and nobody can hear you. Like you, people just don't, they just, you know, it feels like a glass wall. It sounds like an autism or so. Yeah. So there's a mixture of ADHD, what is it? ADHD, PTSD, bipolar, psychosis, and then, yeah, autism. Uh, there could be OCD. Um, yeah, a lot of the traits of autism, like, for example, uh, I don't know, like a love of, a lot, and I can see, yeah, I can see some of those in myself, but for example, I look at people in the eyes when I speak to them, but I do like to plan things in advance, I like things to be in order and stuff like that, but it's not as extreme, for example, as somebody who might have, you know, like, they're all spectrums, right, so it's kind of like, kind of like, kind of like if you had a, what would it be, like an abacus, you know, with the different rows and the different colors, like, you might have only two beads for the autism, but then you might have 10 beads for the ADHD and you might have five beads for the bipolar and then this, and every person is different. So it shows up differently in everybody. Um, so one person, yeah, might be more on the autistic end. They might have more of that bit. It, it's kind of like a, well, like a curry, you know, somebody might have more coriander, somebody might have more sugar. Yeah, <laughs> kind of a weird analogy, but. That's why it's so hard to hard to hard to diagnose. But yeah, the big thing is like you can't yeah you can't control emotions, can't recognize them, and then it's hard to form solid relationships with people because you don't know who you are. So you try to be who you think they want you to be, and then you know. I mean, I've had twenty five different jobs. I counted them. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah. So. Uh... What's the treatment? Are they a oh. treatment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the one that's statistically the most effective is called dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT, uh, which is, it's basically uh, emotion regulation skills training. So the good thing about DBT is that it's good for anybody. Like over lockdown, I volunteered, I co-hosted a live stream where we taught uh, the emotion regulation skills to young people that were living in university housing during lockdown and they were you know they were alone and they were quite suffering a lot of them right pretty difficult time so uh so for example one skill might be a lot of them will make perfect sense but but when you when you learn them they're quite good you learn to recognize your different emotions because you know and you learn to let's see um okay you learn to recognize how an emotional volcano starts before it explodes so some people have like everybody has different little signs that the volcano is starting to bubble, right? So for some people, they might feel like tension in their hands. Uh, for me, it was like a um, a feeling like in my chest, like a slight tightness in my chest. Somebody else might feel their cheeks start to heat up. And when you can recognize what your initial signs are, you can use skills on that emotion to calm it down before it gets volcanic, yeah? So, and one skill, for example, is uh, called check the facts. Um, a very logical one, but I'll give an example. Um, so, for example, I did a show uh, and I was doing a, a parody of Mariah Carey's uh, All I Want for Christmas is You. Uh, the hard soul song to sing, but it was really fun, but I had a really bad cold. I thought I could sing it. Ugh, I got on stage and it was not good at all. My voice was just bleh. Um, and so at the end of the night, I, I go past the promoter. I felt really bad. Um, and the promoter looked at me and, and he was just like, Barbara, go home. And and so I I get up the stairs, I start walking towards the tube, and then my brain starts thinking, Oh, I've disappointed him, he's really he's really mad at me, he's really upset with me. And then I could feel the yeah, the the the, the anxiety and the guilt and the tender, like I just like feel it starting to build and I thought, Oh, I have to check the facts with him. So I messaged him and I said, Can I just check something with you? You know, when you said, Barbara, go home, um, I thought you were mad at me. I thought you were disappointed in me. I thought I had really let you down. And he said, no, no, no. He said, I was worried about you. I thought you'd hurt your voice. 
So as soon as I had that fact, the emotions just, whew, the whole thing just stopped. You know, there was no spiral. They just, everything calms down because I understood that my brain was just making stuff up, you know. So skills like that are useful for anybody, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, oh, another one uh, that's quite useful is, uh, it's called uh, stop. Um, so for example, if, uh, I don't know, let's say you're, oh, you're, you're in line at the bank or something and, you know, someone cuts in front of you um, and you have this strong urge to just like, you know, yell at them or, you know, do something. Um, you just, you just, you teach yourself to just like stop like stop yourself, take a step back, and then observe, like observe what are the actual facts of the situation, like is this person, you know, are they distressed, do they have a reason for, and then you just, um, you stop yourself, you know, you, you just learn to like slow everything down, slow down these reactions so that you can deal with them more effectively. So the book, there's like a load of different skills, what are, another one's called, um, it's called Radical Acceptance, oh I hate that one, but it's very useful. It's like, you know, when something happens, sometimes like something that something's going to happen that's a bit rubbish and we don't like it. I'm okay. Thank you. Uh, we don't like it. And, um, we, <laughs> I might have one later though. And yes. yeah. <laughs> um, and so, um, something happens that that's, you know, for example, a bit upsetting. Sometimes the best thing, if we can't change it is to accept it. But let ourselves fully accept it like not hide it not pretend it didn't happen like we fully accept it we allow the emotion to come and then we visualize the emotion as some people visualize it as different things but you can visualize it as i don't know a boat on a stream so it comes and then you watch it go away or you know it's a cloud you watch it pass by because you know it will eventually leave right anyway long story short there's a load of it like the, the workbook that i used was literally like i don't know an inch and a half thick because it's about all this because for adults, it takes about two years to work through all the skills. But uh, for a young person, someone in their early 20s, say, uh, they can do it in about nine months if they have the right, <laughs> the right thing, the right person to help them and stuff. So, yeah. But then the, ooh, the downside is that if you're over, apparently, I found this out recently because I'm starting to do some advocacy with mental health organizations. And one of them said, uh, for a lot of people that are over 40 and they'll be refused treatment because they're told they're too old to change, which is the stupidest thing ever, right? Because brains are, you know, neuroplasticity is a thing, right? I mean, I did all this stuff at 58. So, so for example, one woman, she wants to do some stuff with me. I think an interviewer said that because she was like, you know, you're proof that what they're saying is ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if I can do it at 58, certainly someone at 45, you know. People can always change. Always, yeah. Never too late. Never, never, never. <coughs> so, yeah. Mm. So yeah. you, uh, when you realize you have a BPD? When did I realize it? So I got the diagnosis uh, four years ago, so right at the start of lockdown. So that was fun. Um, and then and then I spent a couple of days kind of, I was very surprised. I thought, no, I can't possibly have this thing. Because when you, when you look it up and you Google it, like, it's pretty horrible. Like there's a lot of stigma out there, right? It's people just call us, you know, horrible and manipulative and evil and sadistic and narcissistic. Whereas narcissism is a completely different thing, but people mix it up all the time. Um, and I thought I can't possibly have this horrible thing, but then it explained so much. It explained all my recklessness. It explained all the broken relationships. It explained how, even though I've done years of personal development work, I still couldn't figure out who I was or what I wanted to do and blah, 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 all this stuff. I mean, I knew I wanted to do like performing stuff, but I didn't have a clear idea of what, um, so yeah, it's the start of lockdown and then, and then, yeah, four years ago. Yeah. So then I did the two years of treatment all over lockdown. And then at the end of treatment, my therapist was like, okay, now, now that you know who you are, you need to find a purpose for your life. What's something you always wanted to do? And I said, stand up comedy. And then I wanted to cry. Um, and then I found a course and I thought, oh, I'll just do the course like for personal development. I don't have to actually do the comedy. And then the teacher was like, um, he was like, make sure you book some gigs for after the course, for after the showcase, because you're going to wish you had, because it was like six week course. And then at the end, we have a showcase where we invite friends and family to come and see us. And I told no one because I didn't want them to see me bomb. I was convinced I would be awful. And then my kids found out they were in their early twenties. And I, I thought, oh, I can't be like, oh, you can't come. Right. So they came and in the end, I'm glad they came because well, a, it went way, 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 way better than I thought. 
and B, at that time, my material was family friendly, but it's not anymore. <laughs> so yeah, and then I did the gigs after the showcase. And I was lucky. I think I was really, really lucky because my first two gigs went really well. And then I had this big dip. But at least the first two gigs plus the showcase, I thought, oh, I actually can do it. I just have to keep you know, working at it. It was certainly more work than I thought. But it's been an absolute lifesaver for me because it's the first place where I actually feel I fit. And I still get to sing. Um, but I don't have... Because when I started singing, like this was before the internet, so you had to have a, um, a record company and everything. And I had this producer who wanted me to lose... Ugh, two and a half stone and she had me on this horrible diet of 800 calories a day that was not fun uh and when my chest started to disappear i left so anyway i still get to sing but you know on my terms and making people laugh and stuff wow <coughs> you said uh, you said that uh you would never fit anywhere yeah 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 and uh never <laughs> yeah even when you were hot and young and cool? Um, oh, when I was, I mean, when I was, when I was, when I was singing, yeah, when I was singing, I felt like I, oh, how can I explain it? When I was singing, um, I felt like I kind of fit, but I felt like there was something missing. This is going to sound weird, but like, I remember singing in a piano bar and I was doing, um, I remember what I was singing as well. I was singing an old song, Gloria Gaynor's I Will Survive. I'm standing here singing this song, and I remember like bouncing around with the microphone and thinking to myself, okay, this is this is fun. I enjoy the actual singing, but like there's a level missing. I wanted to impact people at a deeper level, but I had no idea what that would look like. So I felt like I was on the right track. I kind of felt like I was like halfway there, three quarters of the way there, but then like there was something missing and I didn't know what it was. I had no idea it was comedy, you know. If you had said to me comedy at the time, I would have been like, are you nuts? I can't do comedy, I can't remember jokes. But apparently when you write them yourself, you remember them, so yeah. And I didn't even think that I could write jokes. But then the course that I did, and um, yeah, we learned that there's actually like a way to write jokes, there's a, there's a, there's a system, you know. There's, I mean, obviously like, some people are just super talented, like, you know, super talented at writing jokes. I don't think of myself as a, as a super talented joke writer. My brain works differently, but I do think of myself as somebody who, it's easy for me to come up with parody songs, parody lyrics. Like, my brain just thinks that way. Like, there's a song that I do about, that you've seen, uh, the one that I do about the zombies. Yeah. And um, so that song, I do a song, for those of you who don't know, about... Uh, <laughs> Oh boy, um, it's a well. Let me let me let me backtrack. Uh, that I do a song about zombies and doing naughty things with zombies. And what? <laughs> that whole song came out of a gig where I walked. In, we were I was uh, booked to do this gig, and we didn't know. None of the acts knew that the whole audience was seventeen to nineteen year old. Oh, <gasps> from the Netherlands. So at least there was that. But That's you know, horrible. That oh. should be one of the worst. <laughs> well, and we didn't, we didn't know. So they're there with their teachers. So I go up to their teachers and I'm like, um, my material isn't really like I have, I can, I don't really swear very much, but there are explicit sexual references. And they were like, bring it on, bring it on. Our kids are fine. Do it all. Do it all. <laughs> okay. You asked for it, right? Apparently they're way, way more liberal in the Netherlands. So, uh, go Netherlands. So anyway, so I, so I'm doing my set and I'm trying to like, you know, edit it as I'm speaking and stuff. And then, um, and then I go to call myself a cradle snatcher and I swear to God, my mouth said grave robber instead of cradle snatcher. And I was like, oh my God, why did I say grave robber? Cause I wasn't even talking about zombies. I don't know what I was talking about. Well, something with sex and younger guys. Um, yeah, that was why I wanted to say cradle snatcher. My mouth said grave robber. And then after the gig, for some reason, I heard uh, Shania Twain's uh, I feel like a woman, that song. And then my brain went, I feel like a zombie. And then out of that came like the whole zombie song out of that gig. Oh, it was really nuts. So like my brain, like, or like I'll hear a song in the supermarket, but instead of hearing the original lyrics, I'll hear something, you know, something different. And then I just write it down and then do it, yeah. And uh, uh, with getting the diagnosis, of BPD, yeah. Do you think it changed you on some level? 
Oh yeah. Well, it brought me out. So here's the thing, right? So, oh, it's really a difficult. Okay, how can I explain it? Yeah. Okay. So before having BP, before having the diagnosis, I felt like my real self was kind of uh, was at the. Okay, I felt like my real self was at the bottom of a really dirty pot, and it was under a lot of gunk, you know. So once I had the diagnosis and started clearing up some of the gunk. When you first start clearing up gunk at the bottom of a pot, a lot of the gunk is going to rise to the surface and you feel worse than before you started, right? And as my ex-therapist explained, he was like, yeah, that's your brain wanting to change. Your brain understands that there's an opportunity for you here to change. And so it's going to throw up at you all the stuff that you need to change and rewire and all that stuff. So, um, so let's get some tissue. A tissue? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm okay. I'm not. I'm, I'm yeah. just. I just. It was like an eye. You know, when you sleep and then you wake up and you have something. I mm -hmm. <laughs> don't. That's kind of goes away. Um. So so let me see. The way my therapist explains it, ex therapist is probably a good way to say. It. When you have BPD, you have. If you think of emotions as horses, um, neurotypical people would have domesticated horses. They can control them and stuff. People with BPD have wild horses. So you have to learn to get them to do what you want. However, the way he explains it is once you get them to do what you want, because they're wild horses, all of a sudden you'll go much faster and further than a lot of people. You just go, Phew. um, and that's what it felt like. Like I, I discovered who I really was. So then when I launched myself into comedy and the singing and all that stuff, it went very quickly. It just was like, Phew. and I wrote the BPD song three months after starting comedy. It just came to me, boom, 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 three days, it was like, oh. and then, yeah, and then I just like wrote a lot of stuff. So I feel like now I'm fully more myself, but it's almost like, uh, let's see, all the, all the angels and the demons, uh, before that, they were kind of locked in a cupboard, so I would only, I would know they were there, but I wouldn't fully see them, and now everybody's out, so, you know, at least it's more authentic, but everybody's out, <laughs> does that make sense? It's kind of like, it's kind of like, uh, I experience everything more fully and, and more as myself. I'm definitely more myself. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah. So at the age of 55, you start to feel like yourself. 58. 58? Yeah. <coughs> well, 60 because two years of treatment. So yeah. Wow. But that's cool. I know that's a long time, right? And how do you know this is yourself? Because... If you don't know yourself for so long, yeah. how do you know this is yourself? Oh, because this is the first time where I feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You know when you have that feeling like of, you know, you're, yeah, it has a, I feel like, oh, this is, because I, you know how people say, oh, everyone has a purpose and everyone's here for a reason and everyone is special and you have to find your thing and do what you love and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I always tried to listen to all that stuff and I would get really irritated because I didn't know what it was. I'm like, oh. So, but now I do genuinely, I mean, I genuinely believe that the reason, the only reason like that I'm here, that I'm even still here, um, is because I'm supposed to be advocating for BPD and doing the musical comedy and all of that. So I literally feel like, yeah, this is the first time I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So I know it's me because this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And also like, huh, I tried just about everything else. You know, I worked in marketing, I worked in... I was a. I worked in legal offices. I licked stamps for the Scientologists in exchange for food. <laughs> I was a clown in the amusement park. I sold advertising. I was a waitress. I was a cook. I had so many. Twenty five. Twenty five different jobs. So, poof, yeah, yeah. It's a bit like um, a bit like you know when sometimes people, someone can be in a relationship and you can wonder if it's the right relationship for you, right? It's kind of like that feeling, but it's the relationship with yourself. You know, so for years and years and years, you don't know if you're in the right thing and should I stay or should I go? And you don't really know if it's right. And then all of a sudden, boom, you, you know, if you were to, I don't know, meet the right person. Like I, that hasn't happened to me, but I imagine I know people that do that, right? They meet the right person and then they're like, everything falls into place. It feels so natural. Um, yeah, that's what it feels like. It just feels like, it just feels like natural. And actually, I feel like I'm most myself when I'm on stage, like doing my weird stuff. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> This is so powerful, and my voice is really gone. Oh. Yes. Uh, <laughs> after talking with you, I'm going back to my room to do voice training again. I, I feel every time after I do the voice training, 
it gets back a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I can't speak much. I will try to use as little words as possible. Yeah. So the feeling of you on stage, you feel fitting. Mm -hmm. I sort of, <coughs> I probably have similar experience. It's like my whole life. I didn't feel I'm somewhere wrong, but I feel I'm not good. Yeah. I feel I don't know what's going on around me. I feel I'm just trying so hard to be more normal. And then after many years of trying, nothing really works. I always had the feeling that whatever I do, I'm just a really a strong imposter mm. and uh, and after many years I just accept okay I'm not good I'm not talented I'm not smart not intelligent just a, a person wants to be an average and it's so hard but then when comedy happened I feel as if I found the, my my weapon yeah, I felt like, like the energy is inside of me. Yeah, and I just feel so right. Yeah, and I realize I'm not stupid. Yeah, I realize I'm not ordinary. I realize I was never the problem. It's the environment. Yeah, around me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds so familiar. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, you feel like you feel like I just thought I was bad at life. You know, before getting the diagnosis and all that. And then when I found that it was my brain that was the problem, I was like, oh, okay. And, you know, you can't cure it, but you can learn to manage it. It's just that it's very, 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 very difficult. And a lot of people don't don't manage to do it. They don't they don't succeed in the treatment because it's so hard. You have to be really stubborn. But, uh, I mean, the, the way it's described, um, it's described as uh, climbing out of hell on a ladder, but the ladder's on fire. And that's exactly what it feels like uh, because you have to um you have all these powerful emotions and you have to face them and you have to like walk through them to get to the other side of them but you have to fully allow yourself to experience them first like i remember i don't know if this has ever happened to you and i didn't know that mental health could be like this but i do remember one day thinking oh my god i didn't know that you could be in so much mental anguish that your body would physically hurt like my whole body was in pain like from my head to my toe. i was like what is going on really weird yeah but i know what you mean yeah all of a sudden you feel like oh i'm not you know i'm not a misfit i'm not like you know a waste of space i'm not wrong somehow it's just that i wasn't in the right situation or the right place doing yeah Doing what I'm supposed to do, yep. And uh, do you feel angry for, oh, feel regret that find out so late? <laughs> well, um, I thought about it and then I thought, oh, that's not, I mean, there's nothing I can do, right? Too late now, so. Um, no, only because that might sound weird, but only because, well, a, a lot of material for comedy <laughs> and also, um, I think, uh, I don't have any regret because, because like life is hard enough. So if I regret stuff, then I'm gonna, yeah, if I regret stuff, then I would be wasting time. Because I don't know how much time I have for, like, touring and doing comedy and stuff. I don't know. Like, at the moment, I feel like I'm, you know, 40-something years old. So, but who knows, right? I um, don't know how long I have, so I just got to make the most of it. So I think, for me, like, regret would be a big waste of time. And also, um, you know, I do feel like uh, it was just supposed to happen that way because then I can be an example of somebody who's able to go through the treatment, you know, much later in life. And so... If anybody says, oh, you're over 40, you're too old to change, I could be like, huh, guess what? Um, so <laughs> I just think it was supposed to happen. It was just supposed to happen that way. Like, I'm, I'm not a religious person at all. Um, 
But I do definitely believe in the whole karma thing and that, oh, I just have to learn certain things in this life. And I think God knows what I did in the previous life. But anyway, I don't know what I'm going to do in the next one. But oh, yeah. I mean, even when, even in the, you know, darkest moments, I remember thinking, oh, but I believe in reincarnation. So even if I were to try to take an exit strategy, I'd just have to come back. So, yeah. Mm. And uh, you said you have children. Yeah, two kids, yeah. <clears throat> Was it hard? Or like one, yeah. That they're yeah. the parent. Oh my God! Yeah, that's actually the only thing where I just think, oh, it would have been very good to know before I had kids for two reasons. The first reason is because um, I can look back at at things like, like I didn't do anything horrible, but I definitely would have been a way better parent. I mean, women talk about how like. Oh, as soon as you have your baby, it's like you're bonded with your baby and they're the most beautiful thing in the world and you forget all the pain. That's a ton of, like, that was not my experience at all. I, I felt quite stressed and panicked and I found the whole thing quite traumatic, if I'm honest. Like, just being a parent, it sounds very traumatic. Um, I don't recommend being a parent. Um, I, that's terrible. Well, if you have the right person and you're really in love, and you're desperate to have babies, and you want to give up a big chunk of your life, then go right ahead. But um, I, mean, I love my kids, but but it was traumatic. Yeah, it, it was. There's no other word for it. It was absolutely traumatic, and I don't think it would have been traumatic if I had the treatment before. That's the first reason. And then the other reason is I probably wouldn't have had children. Well, yeah, I wouldn't have had children because uh, there's a genetic factor with BPD. And uh, well, my daughter won't watch this podcast, so I guess I can say it. So, uh, yeah, one of, one of my kids has it, and I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy, and that's really hard. Um, I mean, I'm sure that they would rather be alive than have it, I guess, but, but like, yeah, if I had known, I don't think I would have had kids. I think I would have adopted, because it's not all genetic. There's, like, genetic, the genetic component is about 25%, but it's like a when you're genetic, you have the button to be there, but you still need uh, some trigger on it. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's four, there's four aspects. So it's like 25% genetics, 25%, oh, well, 20% if you have a family member that, that has it, 25%, what is it? 20% if you're, uh, if you're bullied at school, 25% if you have, uh, yeah, another family member that has it that isn't necessarily a parent. What's the other one? Oh, if you're invalidated as a child. So if, for example, um, I don't know, let's say a child was bullied and they come home and they tell their parents and the parents are like, oh, don't worry about it, it's fine. You know, they're invalidating that child's experience. So if that happens to you repeatedly... Uh, well, that happened to Yeah, so that, there, there's, there's, there's different factors and if you... Just one of them isn't enough to cause BPD, but if you have two or three, like I had four, huh? Oh, trauma, huh? That's the one I forgot. Oh, oh yeah. So that was number four, yes. Oh, that's, that's why, like, uh, there's a, a therapist, he tried to diagnose with me with BPD. But I really don't think I have it. I don't think, yeah. And that's also like a, a, a argument because I I have like three diagnosed illness. Yeah. And there are people like to say, oh, we just write those labels, imagine it or whatever. But no, I'm very informed. I'm not delusional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had other doctors want to diagnose me, other stuff. I know I don't have it. I'm not fucking yeah, yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And they stop like, telling me that I imagine my mental illness. I just have them. Well, and also, yeah, I mean, BPD, like, you can see it on a brain scan if somebody has it. Really? Yep. Wow, that's crazy. Because the amygdala is bigger and the prefrontal cortex is smaller. So you can see yeah. it. So these people that say, oh, you're inventing your mental health. I mean, those people I get very angry because like, like, for example, like, I don't know, the comedians that are like, oh, I broke a nail. My mental health is through the floor because my neighbor's dog's best sister's friend, you know, couldn't get a cookie. Oh, give me a break. They don't know what mental health is. So anyway, yeah. Or the other one, my favorite one is the, this one woman found out that I have BPD and she was like, oh, we all have mental health. And, I felt like saying, bitch, that's like saying to a blind person, well, I have trouble reading a menu without glasses. <laughs> oh, I wanted to slap her. But, you know, some people are like that and they uh -huh. can stay over there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, uh, I, I think there's uh, like a lot of people, they, how do you say, when you have the privilege, you, some people are just so ignorant. 
Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. for example, one of my example is I really hate those people. Now I can waste myself. But uh, when I was younger, every time you meet the new people, they ask, "Oh, how many siblings you have? Or oh, uh, how many places you travel?" And uh, I'm like, I have to make up places. Yeah. Because they are rich, they're from middle class, they are well traveled, they go to different countries every year, and they just assume you have that. Yeah. And uh, by asking you, they force you to to make something up. Mm. Also, I never travel, and then some people even say, "Really, you never traveled? Why? Poverty? Why, bitch?" Yeah, some people are kind of close. I mean, that's that's the other thing. I do think that it gave me a lot of, you know, compassion and stuff because even the trauma that happened to me when I was three, because um, I had repressed it and forgotten it, and then I remember, ugh, anyway, um, I I mean, I believe that's what gives you a lot of compassion for people. And the not that I would want trauma to happen to anyone. I don't. Um, I think there are worse things anyway because at least, at least with me, I forgot like, I don't have a clear movie in my head and stuff, whereas if it had happened later in life, like, oh. anyway, ugh, I don't want to go there. But yeah, that, that's, that's, there's different, there's different, like, components of it, right? But yeah, it's, it's difficult to, and people can't see it, right? So they don't know. So people who do know, and they know about BPD, when they know that I have, like, one woman, she was like, oh my God, and you're doing a solo show here at the Fringe? Wow, that's, like, wow. Like, I didn't know if she was giving me a compliment or not because she was like, that's quite something, you know. Because it's a, it's a, I mean, well, yeah, because there are people here who, who are, you know, neurotypical and find it difficult, right? So, yeah, because it's quite. I, I feel like maybe we even shy more. Wow, suddenly my voice is back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel like, um, I think it's, I drink some tea earlier. Then I had a burp, like I think all the voice may be burp into my cord or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah anyway, yeah. I think maybe we even can do better than your typical people because as your metaphor of white horse, mm. I, I feel fringe is where I can achieve my most potential. Yeah. And I can't, I have ADHD, like focus. And being on time is so hard and organizing. Mm. But here, I have like five lights, the four lights, five tripods, a thousand cables, <laughs> uh, two two phones, microphone. I half of the fringe now. I lost like lost my valuables last time. I only lost one piece of valuable, and this is insane. Given that I have seven shows a day, yeah. And uh, when I'm on the show, I'm hyper focused. Like I feel like I'm in invincible, and I I feel maybe like because here is the optimal uh, environment for us. Like we are doing exactly what we like. I feel we can perform probably better, even more than the neurotypical people, because we have this hyper focus. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's with you. And he was also saying, like, the other thing you said is that when you've experienced, you know, trauma at a young age and stuff, you, you're, you're like, um, you're hyper alert to things because you're so used to having to react quickly and to, and to protect yourself. Like, I grew up thinking, well, I'm, nobody's going to protect me, so I have to do everything for myself. So the way he, he equates it to the velociraptors in a Jurassic Park, you know, that are just like, Phew! you know, someone that's with BPD, for example, or other things, certainly, I'm sure. You know, the slightest little thing, the slightest change in vibe in the room or around us, and we're just like, boom, immediately, like, we just... So it's quite good for reading a room as well, yeah, and yeah, comedy yeah. for, like, you know, people's reactions yeah. and stuff. Cool. Uh, we need to end the podcast, yeah, yeah, yeah. because uh, she needs to go, I need to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you so much, oh, and, uh, yeah. Thank you for Thanks having me. Yeah. Can you rotate the camera? The, uh, no, 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 this, the screen. This? No, the screen. This? The screen. This bit. Yeah. You rotate it this the, the other way. This way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, let me show you. Let me show you. I want you to show you because it's fun. Okay. <laughs> but you don't get it. Oh, okay. Now it will end normally. But I don't know why this didn't end. I really need to poop. So okay. <laughs>